All right. And um, uh, this morning, as we look at the subject, uh, I want to look at a, a, an area of this time that usually doesn't get focused on. All right. Oftentimes, when we think of the day of Pentecost, you know, what's, what comes to our minds? We think of uh, miracles. We think of the Holy Spirit. We think of tongues. We think of uh, Pentecostal, you know, even of that. We, we think of all these things. But I think there's an element in this account that often gets overlooked. And I want to bring that out, uh, uh, bring that out to you this morning. So Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come... They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Now look at verse 14, if you would, please. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now jump down to verse 37. Now, when they had heard this, now what did they hear? Well, remember, Peter stood up, and from that time up to verse 37, he brought a message, okay? It wasn't long, wasn't elaborate, but boy, was it to the point. So let's pick it up there in verse 37, if we can. And when they heard this, when they heard Peter's message, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward uh, generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Father, we thank you, Lord, for just the joyous time we can have coming to your house. Lord, to gather together in your assembly to sing. Lord, to fellowship, to look into your word, Lord, and have our hearts open that you might teach us, guide us, direct us this morning, Lord. Father, I just ask that over the next few moments your spirit would have complete control. Lord, just show us in your word what we need in our lives today. And Lord, help us to realize that this is a living word, that we take it with us each and every day. We don't leave it here at the end of service, but Father, we take it with us to lead, guide, and direct, and be a blessing and honor and glorify you in all things. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, what I want to do is break this down just a little bit because um, I'm going to take an opportunity here, and I love to do this, and I'll, to take an opportunity and tie the Old Testament in with the New, all right? Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, you see it speaks of the day of Pentecost. But what we need to understand is Pentecost was a Jewish festival back in the Old Testament that God uh, uh, established for the people to, to recognize on a yearly basis that they were the Feast of Pentecost, all right? Now, what, uh, what, what you need to know is you go to Exodus chapter 23 or chapter 34, and you won't find the word Pentecost, okay? Pentecost is a New Testament. It's a Greek word. But what you will find is what's referred to as the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, or the word Shavuot, which would be the Jewish word and all Shavuot. In the New Testament, it is interpreted Pentecost, which has to do with the number 50, okay? And I want you to keep that in mind, all right? Kind of file that in your hard drive for a moment, because I'm going to bring that out at the end of the message, okay? So keep in mind the number 50. As I mentioned, it is one of three festivals that all Jewish males were required to return to Jerusalem to observe. The other two being the Feast of Tabernacles and, of course, Passover. All right? On those three occasions, every Jewish male, regardless of where they lived in the kingdom, uh, in the Roman Empire, had to come back to Jerusalem for its observance. All right? So that's why you find, you know, the Feast of Pentecost and such going on, that Jerusalem is pretty much loaded, all right? A lot of people there, a lot, lot going on, a lot of activity during that time. But the Feast of uh, Pentecost teaches us a couple things when we go back and tie in its Old Testament meaning. It had to do, number one, with first fruits of a plenteous harvest, all right? 
first fruits of a plenteous harvest. What happened on the Feast of Pentecost and all is that the first fruits of the harvest that had been planted were offered unto God in blessing and all that He would honor and prosper the harvest that was to come. All right? So it was an offering saying, Thank you, God. Thank you for the harvest. Thank you for your goodness and this abundant supply. And then also, Pentecost pointed to a time when God desires to dwell with His people. Exodus chapter 25, you can go there and you can read that there. But God desiring to, de- to dwell with His people. Of course, if we go back into the Old Covenant, how did God dwell with His people? First, there is at the tabernacle, you remember? And all the tabernacle was built, and in the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And there, the very Shekinah of God dwelt in the center of His people. And what's really neat when you look at the setup and all, is you see how many tribes were there in Israel, remember? How many? Twelve. Twelve tribes. And you see that the tribes were all focused around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in the very center. You had four tribes east, you had four tribes north, you had four tribes west, and you had four tribes south. And so there's the tabernacle, God dwelling in the midst of his people. And then later on came the temple, which was a permanent edifice, but nonetheless, the glory of God dwelt there, and it represented the very center of Jewish living. All right? And the temple, when you study the temple and the tabernacle, they are both a perfect picture of man's approach to God. Okay, how man approaches God and all, and eventually comes to that place of worship there in the Holy of Holies. All right, so keep, keep this in mind that there is a purpose behind this feast or this day of Pentecost that is being observed. Now, what were the results of it? We've already looked at the scripture and all, and we see that there was a great outpouring at that time when God poured his spirit out among those who were there in that upper room. Now, if you go back to the first chapter of Acts, do you remember how many were gathered there? Anybody? It's 120. 120 were gathered in that upper room. And I'll go to the scriptures here in a little bit to show you why they were gathered in that upper room. But nonetheless, so there is this number, this 120 that were gathered there, and we see the Holy Spirit being poured out upon them. Here we see the indwelling of God's Spirit among believers, all right? Now, keep in mind, there's a difference between how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament, how it works in the New. In the Old Covenant, and all the Holy Spirit did not indwell believers, all right? But rather, He came on them at particular times in order to accomplish God's purpose, all right? He came and empowered them to accomplish God's purpose. But in the New Covenant today, because remember, God desires a dwelling among His people, and all He indwells every person who calls upon the name of the Lord, and therefore our body now, not a tabernacle, not a temple, but our body becomes the house of God, all right? Becomes the temple of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we've been bought with a price. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, all right? So if you are a saved, born-again believer today, God literally dwells in you in the person of the Holy Spirit, all right? We understand that? Everybody get that? We're nodding heads? Good. I'm going to move on. So we see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We also see the empowering of the church. Now, we're going to go to a scripture here momentarily. If you want to go ahead and turn over there to Luke chapter 24, you will see, you know, uh, that, the, the, that the believers were to dwell there in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. That power was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would come upon God's people in order, remember, to accomplish a purpose. What was that purpose? The purpose of the church. Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, baptize, teaching them. All right? We need to understand, folks, that anything we do in our own strength, God is not obligated to bless. All right? And I guarantee you it will fail. It is shifting sand, it is shifting ground, and all the walls are going to collapse. But when we do what God has commanded in the power of God through the Holy Spirit, then you know what? We see God working in our midst. And we see the church move forward as God intended it to move forward. We see great things in our lives, okay, as we allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead and direct our lives, you see. 
So we are seeing an indwelling of the Spirit. We are seeing an empowering of the church to carry out the purpose of God. And as a result, what did we see here? 3,000 souls coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We see a great harvest, don't we? But you know what? It didn't stop there. It didn't stop there, okay? Now, let's move on. Number three. I ask you to go over to Luke chapter 24. Um, if, you'll, uh, if, if you haven't turned there, please do so. A couple of scriptures that I, I want to look at. Now, what's taking place here in Luke chapter 24 is we've already had uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, and all he's been on the earth here now for 40 days, and he is about to send, ascend into heaven, and he gives final instructions to his followers, all right? And if we'll pick it up in verse 46 of Luke chapter 24, he says, And said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now doesn't that sound like the Great Commission? Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel. Uh, Acts chapter 1 tells us, first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the world. We, the church, are to take that message okay, of the gospel. It's Christ, okay? And not the message of our church, not the message of some preacher, not the message of anything else, but the message of Christ, which is the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and that God so loved the world, and He gave Christ, that all who believe Him would have eternal life. You see, that's the message we have, folks. That's the purpose that we have. Let's move on. Beginning at Jerusalem, verse 48, and you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now listen. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. All right? So here we see the instruction. Instruction to the disciples. Christ is about to ascend. He says, you stay here until you be endued with power from on high. Now, I don't know if the disciples at this time if they went back in their memory a little bit. But if you remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I'm going to pray and send you another comforter who will be not only with you, but will be in you. What do we see about this Feast of Pentecost? A desire for God to dwell among His people. Are you seeing how the old and new are starting to come together here just a little bit? Okay? You seeing how that's happening? We're going to move on. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. In Luke, Jesus said, Terry, until you be endued with power from on high. And Acts chapter 2, on the day of what? Pentecost. On the feast of Pentecost. On the time when a great harvest is to come. On a time when God desires to dwell among His people. We've already read the, the verses in Acts, haven't we? To see this. Let's move on. What do we see there in Acts chapter 2? A couple of things. One, they were all gathered where? One place. Gathered in one place. Here's that assembly. The word church is the word ecclesia, which means a called out assembly. And all that's what we are doing this morning, aren't we? And all this is a called out assembly. Now, I understand that every born-again child of God, God is part of the church, you know, the worldwide. Never thought, but that church manifests itself in local assemblies today, the body of Christ today. We assemble today out of obedience to what God has commanded. Because He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, you know. And I understand what people say today. Well, I can worship God without going to church. You absolutely can I can read my Bible without going to church. You absolutely can. I can pray without going to church. You absolutely can. But you cannot asse not assemble and be obedient to the commands of Christ. You can't do it. Because he said, don't forsake the assembly, you see. And oftentimes, and we've heard these sayings. I don't know about you. We've heard these sayings. You know, I've. The number of years I've been around, I don't think there's anything I haven't heard. But how many of you have ever heard, or maybe you've even said it, you know, yeah, preacher, I'll be there, good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. You know what you just did? You gave yourself an out. Yeah, you did. You gave yourself an out. 
Or maybe you said this or heard this. Yep, I'll be there if nothing comes up. You just gave yourself an out, didn't you? Because when somebody comes with Redskins tickets or Nationals tickets, you know, or, or the grandkids happen to drop over and everything, you just got your out, didn't you? But God's Word said, don't forsake the assembly. There's an important, we see that these people were assembled in one place together. There's an importance for the assembly. Listen, here's the importance, folks. We need one another. We need one another for encouragement. We need one another for edification. We need one another and everything just, just to do life together and everything. I, I like what Paul said over there in Corinthians, you know, when one part of the body hurts, then everybody hurts. When one part of it rejoices, we all rejoice and everything. That, that's, that's what the body's about, you see. And we need, we, we, we need to put emphasis and everything on the assembly. So they were in one place. Also notice they were in one what? Accord. They were in one accord. That word accord literally means unanimously of one mind or akin to. Now, does this mean that they all agreed that Ford was better than Chevy? No. Okay. Does this mean that they all agreed to hymnals over choruses? No. What does it mean? It means that they were in agreement for the purpose they were assembled. You see, that's what we've got to get a hold of. Folks, listen, we've all got different preferences and opinions. Have those preferences and opinions and all, but we have got to stay firm and founded on the Word of God. Because that is the only thing that, that's going to bind us together. If we sit back, deny the Word, and say, I believe, I believe, I think, I think, then you know what? We're scattered. We're scattered. But when we come together and we see that the Word of God says, Thus saith the Lord, and we are in agreement in that, akin to that, then we see God work. We'll see God move in our midst, you see. It's not about me. Not about you either, honey. It's about Christ. Okay? It's about Jesus Christ. So there they are in one place, in one accord. Now, here's the thing. I wonder what they were doing. Because the Bible doesn't say. Here they are assembled in this place that the Lord told them to be. Now what are they doing? Don't think they're preparing to watch the Super Bowl. You know, I doubt if they drug the board games out, you know, and start playing. And I have heard preached that what they did is they prayed during that time. But yet the Bible doesn't say exactly what they did. So allow me to kind of jump off of that springboard for just a moment and say, I do think they prayed. I do think they prayed. Because, you know, here's what the Lord said. Until you be endued with power from on high. They knew something was going to happen. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Jeremiah chapter 33, the Bible tells us to call upon the name of the Lord because I will do great and mighty things that you've not seen. And that's why I say I believe God wants to do something that maybe it's not even in our mind yet in our vision yet but God wants to do something among his people but folks he's not going to do it as long as our preference and opinions what counts it's got to be according to what, what, what God says here what if those disciples what if Jesus would have said tarry ye here in Jerusalem till you be in due with power from on high instead of tarry they all went back home what would have happened we wouldn't see what happened on the day of Pentecost, would we? But they tarried. And I believe that they prayed. They prayed expectantly, maybe even a little bewildered, but they simply believed that God was going to do something awesome. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it looked like. But God was wanting to do something. And He was, wanting, and he, he was fixing to do something. So let's move on lastly. Number four. I'm going to invite you back to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the, uh, the last couple of verses. Verse 46, notice. And they, who's the they? Come on, folks, who is it? It's the church, isn't it? It's believers. It's those that the Lord said, tarry you here until you be endued with power from on high. It's those believers. So they, what does it say? They continuing monthly with different opinions and preferences. 
Y'all are catching on to me, aren't you? I'm telling you, you better be in the book and everything because I'll screw it up deliberately. I want you to pay attention, okay? And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and, look at there, singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This is familiar passage of Scripture. What we see here is a church in mission. A church in mission. Where were they seen? In the temple. Daily in the temple. Why in the temple? Because t- the temple was a focus of worship. Okay? Focus of worship. They were worshiping God. They wanted to worship Him. Worship is, it just simply means ascribing worth to. They saw God for who He is. And as I mentioned, do you have to be in church to worship God? No, because worship is not defined by place or time. Worship is an attitude and response to God dealing with you. Okay? When we honor Him and we magnify Him because He is worthy to receive all honor, glory, and praise. Amen? Come on. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. He is worthy. And we respond in kind. And there is worship, you see. But then notice, they didn't just stop there. They were where? House to house. House to house. This has to do with relationship. They were building that continuity. They were doing life together, you see. And all. They were building relationship with one another. And, all, and, and learning one another and loving one another and placing one another above themselves, you see. This is, this is a church doing life together, okay? So they're worshiping God. They're doing life together. And then look what happened. And the Lord added. The Lord added. Why did God add to this? Because here's a group of people that were obedient to Him. Not to themselves, not to their preferences, but obedient to Him. Now, let me tie in what I started with this morning as far as the Old Testament, New Testament, where Pentecost fits in. Remember, I asked you to remember a number. What was it? Fifty. Okay, fifty. Pentecost. Fifty. Okay? You're going to see where this comes in. To have a harvest, you have to plant seed. Amen? Any of y'all had a garden this year? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think most everybody's dead. <laughs> yeah, pretty much around there. But nonetheless, to have that garden, what would you have to do? You had to plant seed, right? Okay. Now remember, the Old Testament festival, and all seed was planted, a harvest was given, and the first of that harvest was brought unto the Lord and honored Him, thanking Him for the harvest and looking forward to an abundant harvest of that. So how does this tie into New Testament? Well, the Bible says, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it can't yield fruit. I submit to you that Christ was that corn of wheat. Christ was the one that had to die. And he was buried. He was planted, right? Three days later, he rose from the dead. He rose as the first fruits. Because, see, if Christ be not risen, you and I have no hope. Listen to me today. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, let's go out and eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. We're hung. But we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. And He is our hope. Amen? He's my hope. He's your hope if you know Jesus Christ. He is the first fruit that was offered unto God, you know, in resurrection. And then Jesus, after He arose from the dead, He was on the earth for how long? What? What? Who said three days and three nights? No. (laughs) Forty days. Forty days. And then after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. He told them to tarry until you be endued with power on high. The day of Pentecost was how many days after? Forty and ten equals, you see the Old and New Testament coming together? No. You see the Jewish festival? of harvest, Shavuot, is fulfilled in the day of Pentecost, you see. Christ, the corn of wheat, was buried, you see. He rose again as the first fruits, offering unto God. And then we see the harvest, 
3,000. Why aren't you all glad you're in the front row today? I'm spitting everywhere. But anyway, 3,000 came to know Christ the Savior. A couple chapters over, 5,000 came. A couple chapters after that, they quit numbering because they couldn't count them all. The harvest is great. Why? Because of the obedience, I believe, of God's people to tarry until we do with power from on high. They prayed. And folks, I want to encourage us this morning. There's always about a Sunday in the month that I ask our church to come and pray. You know, to pray specifically for next Sunday. You know, what a harvest we could experience. Not just the fact that Riverside would be here. Not just the fact that some other folks and hopefully visitors and all come that you have invited and everything. But that would be, that would be the springboard to seeing a harvest take place and God doing something mighty and awesome among His people that He wants to do. God's not finished with this church yet. He's not finished. Yeah, we got things to do. But God's not finished here. There's a light that needs to be rekindled. There's a light that needs to shine brightly once again. But folks, it's going to take us praying. And here's what I want us to do. I want to call us to prayer. I'm going to call us to prayer. Um, David, Matt, once again, some soft music in the background, if you would, please. But I want to call our church to prayer and specific for next week. God, bring a harvest. God, do something great among us. That's what we want. God, do something great. But here's what. I don't want you, when you get up from the altar today, say, that's it. I want you to pray on Monday. I want you to pray on Tuesday. I want you to pray on Wednesday. I want you to pray each day through the week. God, do something great. We're calling upon you. Do something great and mighty among us. We want to see you work once again in our hearts, in our church. Would you pray that with me? Would you pray each week? Would you covenant with me? I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Would you covenant with me? You'll pray each day this week. Amen. I need you to pray that. But right now as the music plays, I want to call you forward. Okay? Just come together as a church. Let's pray for God to do some great and mighty things and let God use us to bring honor and glory to Him. As the music plays, come on.